good Perfect. afternoon. I have to wait to find out what Spiff was telling me as we began to go live, because I have next to no control over it, but it's the top <laughs> of the hour. You're listening uh, and viewing Two on One, the internet's number one uh, rated podcast, vidcast, and talk show, where two disciples theologians talk to another theologian about the pop culture topic of their choice. I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm the Reverend Arthur Stewart. Oh, and I'm your other co-host, the Reverend Stephanie Kendall. Oh, hey, That's Stephanie. me. Yeah. So, Not to be confused with a Kendall Kardashian, you know, true. I will name that that's my last name. No one, no one has ever been able to spell it. But now that we've got Kendall Kardashian in the mix, it's a foregone conclusion that most new people that I meet don't know how to spell my last name. Um, the lady who runs the community garden here in uh, the Riverside neighborhood in Wichita, her yeah. first name is Chris with a K and she calls me Art. And I don't, I don't know how to tell her like, I don't go by art because then I would be Art Stewart. And uh, it sounds like I run a used Ford dealership. Maybe you do. Maybe Possibilities are endless for you, friends. Possibilities friend. are endless. So, hey, I had a question. Sure. Uh, I was thinking about this. Okay. We're after Easter. So you've made your round of resurrection resolutions or your resolute erections. Right. Uh, rev Resurrection resolutions is what I call them. You are correct. Oh, no, I think calling them resolute erections is funnier. I there, I can't do a straight face for something that says erection right in the middle of it. Sorry. Yeah, you and me both, sister. Okay, so uh, I don't know. What's the question? Well, how are they going? What's new? Um, are, are there any you want to share? I'm sorry, I could have warned you about this before. I no, it's all good. Um, you know, I I got a Peloton in the last eight weeks. And so uh, right, literally like the week before Easter. And so it leaned right into my, uh, one of my resurrection resolutions is getting back in, in shape, feeling healthy about my body and feeling good about my body. And which has been something that I've struggled with my entire life. And so um, my my resurrection resolution really is, is don't eat past eight o'clock if I can try to, because I'm a big late night snacker. I don't eat until late in the day. And then I eat all throughout the night. So I'm trying to stop at eight o'clock uh, and then to, to work out every single day. So, hey, Peloton, if you really want to sponsor a, a theological po uh, talk show and um, and podcast, we're here for you. I would totally work out every day in exchange for a Peloton, I'd even say nice things about it. Oh, well, so, you know, but so those are my resurrection resolutions this year and they're going well. So that's nice. Um, yeah. I brought it up because our guest today is going to talk about her book that's coming out. Yeah. And I think about how we've had like four guests this year who have books and my new year's resolution that I've actually held to with one small exception has been to buy no personal use books in 2021. So I have a list, which includes Brave Church. And I was just thinking about that. And I guess I wanted to talk about resolute erections. Um, I'm going to stop saying resolute erections. No, you're all right. But uh, so really exciting thing that I get to do tomorrow um, as we're talking about our weeks and our what's happening is I get to do a wedding for my first, uh, I get to do my first in-person wedding with a very small group. It's just the brides and uh, their family. Did and you say the brides? I did say the brides. I'm very excited about that. And it's my, so it's my first in-person. We're all vaccinated. Uh, it's, there's six of us. Um, but, you know, I, I'm still waiting for it because I bought it a little bit too late. But I'm really hoping that either today or tomorrow morning, my Jeff Lunro stole shows up because I bought uh, Pride is coming up. And so I had uh, purchased a new stole for Pride because uh, the park is a big Pride worship and can, you know, march in the street. And so, um, uh, you know, not only am I someone here to say like, y'all go get a Jeff Lunro stole because they're mm -hmm. just, they really are just stunning. Um, I'm, a, I'm a customer. I bought one myself um, and I'm really excited for it. And so if, I don't know, do you have a pride stool, Arthur? I kind of do. I have, I have like my go-to. I have a, here, I'm going to grab it. It's literally right. just right over here. And I'm going to keep talking so people don't think it's weird. <laughs> but like, so this is, this is mine. And you can, oh, your crane stool, yeah. Yeah, it's my crane stool. But I'm always proud of the fact, and this is just exquisitely made. Um, mm -hmm. You can probably see, so I've got like red smudges on the edge at the nape. 
yep. because that is from suntan lotion and uh, cheap plastic necklaces that were thrown when I was marching in a pride parade wearing this. And it's kind of a badge of honor. I love that. So, Jeff Wenro uh, does stoles, pyramids, banners for all sorts of occasions, institutions, denominations, and uh, possibilities. You can check out their website or his website at Jeff Wunro, J E F F W U N R O W dot com. Uh, you can. And uh, and for as everyone knows, uh, and I keep seeing it going around uh, the internet, so I appreciate those of you that are sharing this. Uh, for our viewers and listeners only, and it is the best uh, deal out there for Jeff Wenro Stoles, you can use the code two on one, all one word, all letters, not numbers, uh, two on one for 15% off your entire stole order. So you, Arthur, can get yourself a new pride stole. You can get, an, uh, we have a bunch of I'm going to call them littles, but they're, they're, they're adult humans, but they're graduating and going through ordination processes. And all of our littles are who some of our older and taller and all that bigger than us. Uh, but they're graduating and getting ordained. And so you can order stoles for them too. And there are different ranges of prices and sizes and colors and customization. It's, it is, it is truly a gift that keeps on giving. And it's a remarkable, marvelous. I, I believe I heard somewhere that those stoles still steal the show. So those stoles still steal the show because they are uh, they are uh, 16 years of making ordinary time extraordinary time. So maybe one of your resolute erections is to get a Jeff one. <laughs> Sorry, please don't stop sponsoring us, Jeff. Uh, please check out jeffonero.com. J e f f w u n r o w. And we're talking about Kardashians today, and there's nothing the Kardashians love more than customization. They love all of those things that make things specific to them and and they love to flaunt them and that's exactly what i did with my jeff one row stole it is the it has the disciple chalice on the back it's got the protest fist on the front it is rainbow because i want to make sure that the things that i wear uh kind of tell people who i am as a minister um there's a lot going on around women's bodies and queer bodies uh right now in the legislation and so as a, and it, it, most of what's coming out of that and the um, anti-trans and anti-women bills come from a, an understanding of Christianity that is antithetical to my own. And so I like to make sure that the things that I wear and the work that I do uh, uh, embodies that expansiveness of God. And so Jeff right. does that so beautifully and I'm really grateful for his partnership. Well, let's customize this episode with our guest. Let's do it. I'm so excited for this guest. This is someone that I have known uh, for a couple of years now. We've been friends um, and very excited for her new church or her new book, Brave Church. Um, let's bring in, da, 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 da. I wish we, again, I really wish we had a theme song, Travis. Oh, and happy anniversary of Travis not writing us a theme song. Hello, Elizabeth. Welcome. Hello. To the Welcome to essentially the birthday episode of Two on One. We realized uh, sometime this week that we were like, oh, it's been a year. Happy oh, anniversary. So congratulations. I guess, yeah. Like, I mean, yes, but like it, it feels both like we've never not done this and also we've always done this. All right, so Elizabeth, uh, tell me about yourself and why I watched some episodes of Keeping Up with Kardashians at random to get ready for today's episode, please. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It is. It's okay. First of all, I have been laughing about doing this ever since we made this appointment. That this, I mean, it has brought me a lot of joy. And so, for that, thank you. Because I, uh, my husband makes fun of me when I watch the Kardashians and or any trashy TV. But I, I love it all. I really do. And I was watching an episode, and he saw me, and I was like, "It's research, Kevin." <laughs> Um, you can write it off, right? I know, like, go away. Like, it's research. Like, this has a real, um, real a, a real value today, so. As for me and my house, we will stick with the housewives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so tell us a little bit about, you have a new book coming out. Um, tell us a little bit about what brought that book about uh, and where our people can get it, which I'm assuming I did my pre-order, but I did it off the website, off of your website. So, well, man, you get extra credit for that. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, yes. So my name is Reverend Elizabeth Hagen and I have been a pastor in a variety of different settings for the past 15 years or so. Um, I have always found myself drawn to ministry of people that are on the that maybe are not always included or welcome in church and that 
the, the people that have found their way to congregations where I've been pastor or to other things that I've done have been those who are open-hearted, who are looking for acceptance and belonging, who are looking for a place of um, deep and real community. And so I think the other things that I've done in my life um, as I've begun a journey of being an author and a writer, um, I'm really most interested in writing about things that help people feel less alone. So my first book um, called Birth, Finding Grace Through Infertility was about a long struggle to try to add children to our family that my husband and I went through. And um, what happened, it was in 2016 when that book came out and I was doing what authors do, right? You go back when we had like live events. Remember that? Vaguely. I know. I don't actually have <laughs> Where that. I would like go to someone's church and do a small group or preach or something. And what was really interesting about that experience was that as I was talking um, or trying to, to book engagements to talk about my book, that had to do with infertility is that all these pastors were telling me, well, you can come. I mean, I like you as a person, but please don't talk about infertility. Um, even though the statistics say that one in eight couples in America struggle with infertility in some way or another. And so I had to get creative and figure out a way to still have speaking engagements. And so I started doing these workshops on grief that we don't talk about in church, because I think that we're really good at like death you know, I, I grew up in the Baptist tradition where everybody had their set casserole that they made, you know, for the funeral food situation. So, or, you know, how to send a card, you know, sympathy card or something. But what I heard when I was doing these workshops, there's all these things that we don't talk about in church. And I began to try to find a resource or think of how I could create a resource that could help people begin to tackle tough topics, not just infertility, but other things like, uh, domestic violence or mental illness, um, racism, sexuality, um, so that we would all feel a little less alone. Um, so that's how Brave Church was born a couple years ago when I began writing it. I love that. Yeah. And it is fascinating that church is like uh, the statistics with like miscarriages and right. the things around fertility are so prevalent. And I did not know that until four years ago when a friend of mine was like, look at this and we say nothing. And I, yeah. Yeah. And, and because, you know, there's so much patriarchy in our, the way that we do church. Right. And there's so much traditionalism and there's things that we do and we're trying to be good. You know, we're trying to be, you know, community happy places, but you know, there's so many ways in which we can be really hurtful um, in the church and maybe not even know it. And uh, so um, you know, I, I find that sometimes people don't want to, to, to hear what I have to say because no one wants their, you know, sweet little Mother's Day situation ruffled a bit. But I mean, um, my husband has on his um, phone uh, a ringtone for me and it's the song Troublemaker. Do you know that song? Uh, by Weezer? Yes. Yes. And so I just, I kind of, I try to embrace it. Like, I guess is what I do now. I talk about things that people don't want to talk about. So. Hey man, you're in good company. In the church? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> smelling salts. Um, so, so let's talk about keeping up with the Kardashians if we could. Yes, let's um, do that. But really, let's talk about wealth and identity and values. Um, so keeping up with the Kardashians is gone in its 19th and final season on the Bravo yeah. Network. Is that correct? Is it 20th season though? 19th or 20th season. Maybe it is. I've, I've only seen promos for it actually while watching <laughs> Housewives um, <laughs> for the modern stuff. It follows the Kardashian family. Uh, Kim, Chloe, Kylie, Kendall. Courtney. Courtney. Five. Um, five well, there's the five girls, and then you have I mean, Rob. you got to count Rob, who's never on, right? You got to count Rob. Well, yeah. Rob's in the early seasons. And he is. He is. And my favorite, Scott Disick, who is just a mess and an amazing, marvelous, horrible mess. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, to, um, oh, okay. gosh. Uh, what's that? Then you have Chris. Chris. And then Caitlin and her journey uh, through all of that. Mm -hmm. So, what is the why? Why does this go for twenty years? Um, and it's not a critical question. It's it's yeah. Well, can I tell you one fun fact about the Kardashian as it relates oh. to what I just said? Okay. Every so, um, I when I have a, like a really big like serious project, I don't know if you guys are like this. I somehow need something equally unserious going on at the same time to um, keep things 
keep things going. And so when I was the summer, it was 2019 when I was doing most of the research for Brave Church and teaching it to my congregation while I was writing it. I binge watched the Kardashians the entire time I was watching Brave Church. So it just feels, I don't know, maybe there's some Kardashians in Brave Church that, you know, there's some secret um, symbols or something, but um, it, it, it helped me a lot. So I like that. I just wanted you to know. I mean, I think that that's really great. There's something to the Kardashians and why it works. It's because they have, you know, they, first of all, they repostured what we understand celebrity to mean, right? Like we right. have grown into what, and it also kind of gives me a little bit of hope that we can reposture what church means, what, who we, what, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a person of faith, because like with enough vulnerability and enough uh, invitation into, I guess, what the unknown, like we allow hope to, to kind of bloom, right? Like the Kardashians did nothing in the very beginning other than say, you know, they've got a friend in Ryan Seacrest who was like, let, let's let just, you're how, you're, you are a blended family. It's real. I think it, the original thought was like, here's a real modern family. Like, let's go into their, their lives with cameras and, you know, and the girls, at least Kendall and Kylie were super young when it started and mm -hmm. grew. And so there's something there about vulnerability um, and opening yourself up to that unknown that I think for me, as I rewatched some of these things too, I watched early seasons, I'll name, like I, I used to watch it like weekly with like my friends and like mm -hmm. stopped years ago. But um, so I went back for a little nostalgia on the early stuff, but yeah. that was awful theme music with the like whistling and whatnot. Oh, and, then Kim, and then Kim was in the middle and everyone, she was like, you know, yeah. dancing and they're all like, um, you know, making faces at her that. that was exactly. Um, and it was really, you know, it, it reminded me of church as I rewatched them, that there are people that want to posture themselves in the middle of those group photos. And yet the people that in, in this world who stay consistent and kind of do their own thing, end up kind of outshining those who, who put themselves in the middle sometimes. Um, but I don't know what, uh, is there a space for, for the church to learn from that vulnerability of the Kardashians? Oh, absolutely. And the fact that, you know, they went, they, you know, the journey of the Kardashians through all these seasons, I mean, they are not the same people they started the series as, I mean, the makeup of their family, their jobs. I mean, uh, but yet they've allowed people into their lives and allowed that change to happen and that natural evolution to happen of who they have become and who they, what they do and who they are. And uh, I think that's really beautiful because I think sometimes in the church, we get just stuck on like, okay, you know, this is, this is our mission statement. This is our <laughs> values. And it, you know, you could go back and visit a church in 10 years. And of course there's less people there than were there, you know, 10 years before, but it still feels exactly the same. And I don't think any of us are staying exactly the same. I mean, you know, like 14 seasons ago of me, I mean, I was not this, right? <laughs> so, oh God. If we think of our life in seasons, that's. Oh, awesome. yeah. And that I'm sorry. Funny. So, 14 seasons ago was Arthur moving to Fort Worth for Div School. I would totally go back and fire the writers on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was really kicking it and I was not, it would have been a fun season to watch of Spiff, right. but, when, but in, in hindsight, it wouldn't have, it would have been the season that I probably would have been like, oh, can we just tuck that away? Can that, can that go in an archive somewhere? Right. And, and they've never been um, ashamed to, you know, good, bad, and ugly or whatever, like showing their real experiences, you know, all the breakups. I mean, I think it's really powerful. I, I think one of my favorite parts of the Kardashians is the season when, um, transition to Caitlin and how they handled that so openly and you really felt like you saw the the pain and the loss and the hope and the new beginnings and everything that went into that and I think the show could have if they had done that you know less vulnerably or less openly maybe it wouldn't have become what what it continued to be that would have kind of stopped maybe um, but they they blazed a new trail and um, it worked. So when when a show gets stale, it jumps the shark uh, from that wonderful Happy Days incident in which Fonzie and Full Leather Jacket jumped over sharks in Hawaii, I think. Um, like that, yeah. Did the Kardashians jump the shark? Was there ever a shark for them to jump? 
or is it, it does vulnerability prevent that? And I'm, I'm going to have a follow-up question, I promise, that's theological in nature. Can you ask that question in a different way? Have the Kardashians <laughs> gotten stale? Like, is there a point, do you think, in the 20 years that people are like, okay, we're past this, like it needs to end? Mm. I think there can be oversaturation of something. I mean, uh, because I told you I, I, I did a deep binge on this, um, I watched everything, including like all of the um, Kim and Chloe take Miami, Kim and, Kim and Courtney go to New York. Like, oh, like I, you did. I mean, you did I, did the, I did the side trails, like, because I'm like an overachiever. Um, I'm a three. Yes. So if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And so I was like, okay, we're going to watch all of them. I mean, I did fast forward some, you know, sure. it gets a little much, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it got to a point, I think in some of kind of the mid episode, I mean, mid journey, or it just felt like, okay, you know, I'm over this a little bit, but. Well, sure. well, when, oh, go ahead. No, please. Oh, you know, I, one of the things as I, I redid some of my, I watched some of the episodes that I hate and some of the episodes that I like like um and because i think that they do you know there's bravery there when kim talks about her and uh her struggle to conceive and you know and 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 carry babies and things like that like and all of that they also give us the the nuance and complexities of villains that are that are challenging and also like hard to hate right like you want to hate scott for lots of different reasons and there are mm -hmm. episodes that you have to hate scott the, like that the scott that shows up in those spaces are is a is a terrible human and yet he is the father of Courtney's children he is uh, someone that has contributed to the life value of this community and so it's hard it, you know it's hard to just write him off completely um and so for me as I was watching I was like oh this is a a really interesting um kind of space to hold for church when there are people that come in and want to change the systems and do really terrible things you know within the community and and we want to write them off and yet as people of faith people that operate in a currency of grace it's really hard for us to do that completely and I think that they they uh they showed that well um yes. because I still think it, it, the social narrative around Scott is not great um and I think partially because of those early years um and yet he's still in the lexicon we all still know who he is and know who he's dating from time to time and well and the, i am fascinated by the sister relationships i mean because you see some just blowout fights you know on different points sometimes chloe and courtney are like bff sometimes they hate each other's guts sometimes they love kim sometimes they don't and and yet somehow through it all they end up getting back together. I mean, I'm not a person who, you know, came from a big family or had a particularly close relationship with my, my sister, but I think, I, I just admire that, that they somehow can, can fight, but they, they have the common value of we're family and in family, we always, we always come back to each other. So because the story is not scripted and i'm putting a big asterisk by it scripted. Because, yeah they <laughs> i have to use the housewife model because i'm more familiar with it but they're like oh i'm taking everybody to the orchard where we'll get drunk in a cornfield like that's not what i did with my friends actually okay i did once but that was a long time ago anyways um when when it's unscripted or mm -hmm. raw there's all of this room because it can go in any direction like the scott disick story is neither alive nor dead it's both because it's 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 actually it's just it's alive it's in process it's growing so the church do we does the church suffer from trying to script itself out like you mentioned mission and values and vision mm. and you know we have identity and identity is stuck yeah um and i've seen churches that don't have values they have identity statements where it's you know through mm. sunday school and worship yeah. and fellowship we yeah. proclaim it's like tell me what you care about show me grow it let it go yeah i mean i've been i've been um talking to people a lot lately about break church and people ask me questions like well do you think this is even possible could we even you know could we be brave or are you know some people just kind of look look at me like deer in the headlights like why why did you even write this this is ridiculous no we can't do this 
but the thing I want to tell people, which relates to what you're saying, is that like I believe that this, you know, I I have hope for the church because of of the spirit, you know, that the spirit is leading us into things that may be like completely mind blowing or something that we've never thought of or we've never done or we've never experienced before. But if we stay on the path of the spirit and are have an open heart and an open mind to what our faith community might look like or what our faith expression might look like. I, I think some really beautiful things can happen. Um, and especially if we don't have that sensor of saying, okay, stop, <laughs> we, we, need to, we need to organize this more or we need to get this approved by this committee. Oh God, you know? Um, I love the world, God did not form a committee. Yeah, really. That's weird about Trinity, but I'm pretty sure it's still fair. It's true. Uh, what's your Hogwarts house, by the way? I just got to know for the sake of coming off five weeks of it. Um, I, I I have no idea. Okay, that's fair. Okay. I'm sorry. That was a that we didn't warn you about that. And that was a, <laughs> uh, so with bravery. Um, is bravery a choice? Yeah, I I I, I do, I do. I do think it's a choice, and it's something that it's a muscle. I think that mm. we work to become a little bit braver. Um, every day, if that's something that we we choose, you know, and uh, what I'm saying in brave church is that it's a, I, I think brave churches are those that are willing just to take the first step and have a conversation, knowing that, you know, I think we want to like know the end results when we start something like, okay, are we gonna, we're gonna talk about racism, so then we're gonna like do this, and we're gonna create this new policy, and we're gonna reshape our community, or blah, 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 blah you know, but don't get so consumed in all that, just just start, you know, by naming racism and beginning to um, dialogue about it. And I think that's brave. That's so brave. And I, that is a three on the Enneagram response. Just <laughs> do it. Do something, right? Just do, do it. Do something. <laughs> and move forward. Yeah. Yes. And of course, I'm like, but we need to think about it. No, but, no, no, no. No, we need no. to go. <laughs> right. You get two. You're gonna get two threes right here being I'm like, let's go. In the back making jokes. That's what I do well. It's fine. Um, no, yeah. no. Go ahead, Arthur. No, it's okay, please. Uh, well, I, I wonder like what your experience is in, in writing this book and, you know, and being informed. Uh, I can't imagine that the Kardashian, the spirit of the Kardashians isn't imbued in these pages because of if you're watching it every day, because I'm some, I'm like you, I put something on in the background that like, especially if I'm doing like some hard work, you know, like writing a eulogy or, you know, like thinking out worse and things that are like really moving right my, moving my heart muscle and my brain you know and all of that like i i'll throw on you know something silly in the background um right. and and um oh where was i going with this question oh it just flew right out of my brain um as it happens oh that's what uh what about the spaces that we don't know we need to be brave in mm. how have we navigated like because some of it is that you know, the definition of what is racist for pe for especially um, unaware white people as they grow in that work, right. all of a sudden, you know, oh, they look, you know, we look back and think, oh, I really should have said something there. I needed to be brave there and I wasn't right. or things like that. Right. Um, in your experience of writing this book and in your experience of watching shows that, you know, for lack of a better uh, space, like I want to say the Kardashians are brave in what they are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they come out and they, you know, they, for better or worse, there is, there is courage there. And uh, so I guess maybe if you could, in your own understanding, what's the difference between courage and bravery? Um, and what do we need to discern those in our uh, spaces of worship or in our lives? Um, and how do we lean into that? That's a big question, Stephanie. Um, yeah, it is. It got away from me. Like, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, find myself, maybe I'm not nuanced enough using courage and bravery um, often in the same sentence, you know, well, that we, to be courageous is to be brave. Um, uh, but I, I, I think it's a journey and I think that you have to be aware, you know, when I was leading of my brave space conversations in my church, you know, I had obviously shown up doing my homework, like having thought through the topics that we were going to talk about that week and thought, okay, you know, I, I, I see all these viewpoints and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm pretty well situated. 
but then someone would mention something or share an experience or call out my own bias. And I think you just have to stay in that discomfortable place to mm. know that I don't have all the answers. I have not lived someone else's experience. I'm going to grow and learn in this, even if I'm the leader and um, we're all better for it. But if, if we go in with a posture of, okay, I know this, or yes, I'm the bravest person in the room, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Um, but it is very, it is uncomfortable. And it, you know, I don't like to be, I like people to be well and happy and like me, you know, and I'm not gonna, yeah. And I don't want to be, um, call out. I'd rather, you know, do it right the first time, but you know, if you're going to be brave, you're going to have moments where people are going to let you know that you didn't do it correctly or you offended them. Because one thing that I, I write about a lot is that respect for you does not look like respect for me um, because of our lived experiences. And I've seen that play out in so many different contexts, you know, because people just say, well, just don't take things so personally. Well, uh, no, um, no. So what I'm hearing is we need to, to lean into the space or at least be to notice the spaces of discomfort because uh, they're probably pointing us a little bit towards the, the bravery that is necessary to move forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to be like able to, to, to be called out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm still working out how to phrase this question and I do hope you'll forgive me because this is an Arthur Stewart special. Um, it's part of the fun of reality television is they don't follow regular schlubs. They follow um, people who are, yes, blended families, or yes, just like you and me, but happen to be multimillionaires or happen to be very rich and exotic and everything else. Um, and of course, part of that shows a regular humanity. And part of that, uh, John Steinbeck said, there will never be class a uh, class war in the United States of America when most Americans think they're temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Mm. Um, mm. Like it, is it Kylie who they're like, she's the first self-made billionaire. And it's like, it's mm. not, it's not self-made. Like she is very much reliant on the family name and, and what has come before. Like that's mm. not self-made, but also it's horribly unethical for there to be billionaires in this world. So my question is, how do we balance entertainment with ethics or with church? How do we, how do we, you know, some people are like, I just need the fellowship. I just need the security and safety of the people I know. Mm. But how do we, how do we balance what is with what could be? And there it is. What do we do with now and not yet as a brave church? Mm. I told you there was a question in there. It just Yeah, like, I, I heard it. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was shaving the marvel. Well, the pri the privilege of entertainment, and uh, that's a whole that's a whole series of questions. I mean, I that's convicting, you know. Every time you you go down that train of thought, but talking about the balance um, between um, being courageous and being brave in a in a community, and also um, getting what we need out of it, is that kind of what you're talking about, Arthur? It is. That's a great. Yeah. Point. Well, you know, I, I write about the difference between safe and brave space, um, safe space. Theoretically, a church is supposed to be safe space, you mm -hmm. know, a place where we share a sense of common values and beliefs. We know each other. We love each other. Um, we we come from a place of respect. But, you know, I had people who were um, helping me um, edit some first drafts of this, and they said to me, um, my, it's lovely what you're writing, but my church is neither safe nor brave. <laughs> and uh, they said, I, it doesn't feel safe to me because if I were to open my mouth, then and if they knew this thing about me, then I just don't feel like that I would be accepted. So, I mean, we have some work to do on, on that. Um, but I think bravery is often a intentional choice that if you're leaving, quote, the, the cocoon of how nice it is to be around people that you've known for a long time or that you feel comfortable with. I, I write a lot about how a, a brave space, a brave church group would, would have some intentions about how they would begin to have conversations with each other, that they would make an intentional choice to say, this is a different kind of gathering, that we're going to do things a little bit differently than when we're just like, you know, drinking punch and having coffee um, and eating those cookies, you know, this is, this is a different type of being together. 
And I don't think we can be brave all the time. I mean, you know, it's a lot of work and it sometimes takes us, say we're in a really brave space of a conversation with a group or a friend. I mean, sometimes we got to retreat from that and get some energy back to go back to a safe place, you know, and process it. Bravery um, is a muscle. Yeah, it is. Can't just work out, work out, work out, work out. And uh, sorry, I was just agreeing. I didn't mean to stop you. Excuse no, me. no, you're right. Yeah. And um, so I, I, that's my hope is that, um, that some congregations will take this journey with me this fall to, to work out um, their some brave muscles as you're talking about. And, you know, one really exciting thing about this book is that your um, very own partner, Arthur, Stephanie, is her congregation is featured as a brave church in the domestic as, violence as chapter. well they should be. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about that. Give me a little preview if you don't mind. I mean, I, I've already put the <laughs> book in mind. I've written, I've written it in the, I can order this for church book. So. Awesome. I love to hear that. Yeah. So um, at the end of every chapter where I'm unpacking a topic and giving some thoughtful, hopefully commentary uh, to think through is I offer some examples of some congregations across the country that are doing something innovative or brave in the area of that particular topic. And so I was really excited to learn more about Stephanie's ministry um, around domestic violence and you know, I was just telling somebody about this, Stephanie, a couple of days ago about your practice of if you were to talk about some of the sacred texts that bring out some of the more harsher experiences that women in the Bible have, or, you know, you're unpacking them and doing so in a really thoughtful, um, theological way, that you often bring in counselors um, or mental health professionals to help be that support to dialogue about that. Um, I think that's wonderful because it, it shows that we can't do this work alone and that we have to talk about it. You know, we don't just read the Bible and like gloss over the really hard parts, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, so that was uh, the, we, you know, we, we do Bible study, we're a church. Uh, and so we had done a text of terror kind of uh, Bible study with an emphasis in, um, in uh, intimate partner, partner violence and domestic violence and Reverend Sydney Avant um, is part of our congregation. And she was, you know, led part of that, just saying like, this is, we need to model that we have, you know, you have to bring in uh, a network of help to support uh, that journey. And I think for us, what that really looked like and why that was really helpful is because it also postures the congregation to understand that your clergy aren't also going to carry everything for you. I'm not a, I'm not a counselor. Uh, I'm happy to listen and hold space and all of that, but like I have my own therapist. Um, I, you know, and I have my own person to process with. And so if I do that, why would we not offer? that to the congregation for these really hard texts um, and for things that are are triggering um, which honestly can be a lot of things at this point but um, that's where that really started and so I'm grateful that you are lifting that up because it's something that we are proud that we do because um, we take mental health very seriously um, and we take intimate partner violence really seriously so and an important reminder to clergy hopefully you've just heard from that that you may not be a mental health professional either the no. best thing you can say is, let me refer you, or let's find out who can help you further together. Um, the, the the four on the floor is the rule, friends. Yeah. Um, yeah. And sorry, I know you guys know this. I'm just saying that as a reminder to, yeah, our, no, it's to one of our listeners who may be like, I have to solve all of the world's problems. No, you don't. The hell you do. Call right. somebody now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth, you've talked a, a little bit of, well, we've talked a lot about this, about, you know, bravery being, being a muscle. And I really like that. I think that's, um, uh, it's a really helpful uh, vision of like how to be brave, you know? Um, so what are we working out that muscle for? What is the effect you hope that being brave now might have for, let's say, our children and or the people that come into our churches? Um, maybe, you know, children, a child or not, regardless of age, but like, you know, what, what is, what is the benefit of being brave? Yes, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked because I, I think being brave gets a bad rap because it's so, it's, it's hard in many ways. It's much more easy just to be silent or to stay comfortable. Brave, I mean, if we have to be honest, it can be very difficult to be brave, but the benefits of being brave are, are amazing because it fosters a sense of deep acceptance and belonging and community. 
And I don't know about you, but that's, if I'm going to invest my time in a group of people, um, if I'm going to be a part of a faith community, that's what I want from that experience. Um, I want to know that I'm loved and I'm seen <laughs> and that I'm welcome just as I am. And I think brave churches, brave communities are places where people feel, you know, we always talk about being welcome, but we don't really mean that. But they actually, they actually feel welcome because they know that like, you know, I had people in my congregation when I was teaching this, you know, talk about that they had had an experience of domestic violence or talk about racism at a level that they had never uttered before. Um, and we all felt closer together um, as a result of the experience. Like I, I saw, I saw people in a different way and it was really beautiful. So. Hmm. So I, uh, I'm doing a deep study of the second letter to the Corinthians. I did the first letter to the Corinthians last year. Uh, that's for our friends who have a bingo card. I haven't said it, talked about this in years. <laughs> Um, the Greek word is paresia, and it's not only in public boldness, but in private vulnerability. Mm. Um, and it's used both ways in the Hellenistic world. And whenever Paul's like, and with boldness, you know, before God, it's really, and in relationship that is so thoroughly ours. And I know Paul is a awkward topic, uh, because stupid Plato ruins everything, but, um, I, <laughs> It just it, boldness, bravery, courage, they, they, they kind of tie in together. So that's true. And, and I think about my own experience of walking through child loss, miscarriage and infertility for years. And what I most appreciated about relationships during that season um, of grief in my life was people that were willing to go there, like just to hear the stories and didn't make me feel bad or less than um, people who just created space, um, even if it was awkward or <laughs> they didn't know what to say, but they just held that with me and for me. And um, I felt so much closer to them because they really knew what was going on in my life during that time. So and I love that. I love that for, oh, go ahead, Arthur. No. I was, I mean, and it's, I, I you know, I'm ho as I'm listening and thinking about like what who has empowered me to be bold in my ministry and brave in my ministry? Um, and what does that support look like? Um, you know, I think about my, my friends, my family, my chosen family um, and people like that. And then, you know, it just, popping into my head is Chris Jenner saying like, you're doing amazing, sweetie. Like mm -hmm. I, I love that gift. Cause I think it's, a, I don't know, as a three, I really need to hear that sometimes. And mm -hmm. like, I just need that, that encouragement and things like that. Um, does the church need a Chris Jenner? Do we need uh, someone that that is guiding our steps into this larger vision of, and I mean, kind of like both the small C and large C church, like who yeah. is for us um and you know she she cast for better or worse chris vision has cast a has has or she's cast a vision for her family and helped it come to fruition in ways that both center her own experience and doesn't allows for uh, other peoples to thrive and i wonder um does bravery need someone at the helm well i think we can collectively encourage each other to be brave. It doesn't have to have one leader, but I think we need brave cheerleaders in, in mm -hmm. our life, right? Exhortation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I love that spiritual gift if we wanna go down the Corinthians path. Um, it's one it of my favorites. leads back to Corinth. I does. <laughs> it makes me wonder, what do you think, Enneagram, what do you think Chris Jenner is? She is absolutely a three. Yeah, I think she's a three. I, I know we're not supposed to talk like real yeah. people, but she's probably a character in part on the show because of reality. <laughs> probably so. Well, and I think threes for is the one of the things that I love being a three most is that I get to cheer on my people. I love being a good cheerleader for, yeah. for, for yeah. my people. And I think that that's an undervalued understanding of threes that we think that we're all about just our own, you know, like no. getting our own self out there. And I was like, like no, not at all. We want the vision to go forward. We really do. And so, um, but I, you know, I think Elizabeth, you and I probably suffer from that same thing where people think it's just about us and we center our, you know, and it's like, it's no, like really, no. I, there is nothing that brings me greater joy than like cheering on my friends and like, and, and seeing the vision of, of, and of what they long for their life and what God is, you know, doing with them and having it succeed is like, 
Oh, I just get so I know, I know. Like um, the the verse, I think it's um, Isaiah. Um, I'm being a bad pastor because I can't tell you the chapter, but it's like the verse. I think it's um, maybe 43. See, I'm doing a new thing. You know, it springs up. 43, 19. Yeah. Yeah. Do you not perceive it? It's probably like the threes theme verse, right? Um, of the Bible. But yeah, I mean, I um, I'm I'm excited to be a cheerleader for churches to be more brave. I mean, what what I hope most for this book is that I I just want churches to to talk about it. Like, you know, I don't care. Pick pick two chapters. You know, if you can't do the whole thing, pick two, pick one, and just start talking about these things because I I mean I found, I don't know, you guys are pastors when, um, you know, I'm doing a study or a small group or something, you know, I always have a plan, but if people actually just are in the room together and are having conversation, you never quite know what's going to happen, but it's always really fun to see new insights happen or people feel more connected and, and it's, it's never not a win. And, and I believe that brave church can be a win (laughs) for congregations. If they just talk, um, Mm -hmm. they just start talking and uh, not talk not talk past each other the way that we normally do a lot of times in kind of Christian community. Well, and it's, I, I had a friend uh, a long time ago named Varghese and Varghese would never answer the question, how are you? Um, mm. Because he was like, that's American for hello. And I've already said hello. <laughs> what you want me to say is fine, how are you? And I'm, I'm just not gonna do that. And I love that Varghese would literally just like stare you down, like what is wrong with you? Really fun guy. <laughs> Um, but he, he and I developed the questions, how are you loved and how are you loving, Mm. which we did not always answer because we reserved the right to say, I I can't answer that right now. But when so that moment of reflection created vulnerability, that vulnerability created community. Um, I think it's, I think that's the same question instead of it, here's our agenda for Bible study. Um, you know, so let's talk about Ishmael. Like, what do you think? Like that kind of stuff. I, right, I'm, I'm right, yeah. I'm trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. I'm not trying to. Right. So. Well, so you you talked a little bit about brave, you know, like anything can happen in, in person. And I think that that's part of also what makes the Kardashians really wonderful, right? Is anything can happen. When you, when you put that many people in a room, you know, and, and at that point, like all of the girls, when it started, like all the kids were living in one house, you know, because they were all like, teenage or at least the little ones were young teens yeah, they were going to like cheerleading camp and stuff like exactly you know? like and look at them now run and then all and all of and so um you know that anything can happen and i think that that's really um beautiful right we've lost a little yeah. bit of that because we hyper script our communities and and our worship experiences and things like that and yeah. so um Ooh. yes Ooh. you have a question off that go for it i do but i don't want to take away your no, go for it is church actually a place where anything can happen anymore? Well, I just thought of this um, one year. I did a like a, a resurrection or an Easter series on you know the the questions or unended nature of resurrection. And so one Sunday, I freaked everyone out, and I just had a blank bulletin. Like the cover was there, and the announcement were on the back, but they had no idea what's going to happen. And I mean, we basically did a lot of the same things, but it was, it was so cool to see people, you know, in the moment with it a bit more than just, you know, getting their um, hymn number right or finding the Bible passage ahead of time, 10 minutes and not really being present. It it, it was a fun, fun freak out pastor moment. Um, But But that's brave too, right? I mean, like, and there's something there that like, uh, when we tell though even those stories inspire us into bravery for our own spaces right and that um, maybe taking names off of you know I don't know how you how worship ended up uh, organically coming to but maybe that's the space in which young Timmy over here felt the call to lead a prayer that they had never done before you know or whatever the invitation uh, it, when we take the script away the invitation becomes wider right and so uh, I had this music director who was amazing. His name is Ken Williamson. Hi, if you're listening, but he, he, he used to listen to my sermon and then he would compose a song, like as I was preaching somehow connected to the sermon and, and then he would sing it afterwards and it was for the operatory or whatever. And it was, it was 
incredible but that was his way of like listening was like thinking about how he was going to play you know I guess like a kid drawing you know in the service like a picture um you know this is what God looks like at the end or something but yeah because every person has a gift that they can contribute and that's why we should worry about people speaking in tongues through the whole thing because there's they're getting in the way of other folks because that's first Corinthians again that's <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I like you're keeping up with the Corinthians with too. The yeah. There you go. Uh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, but and and what I'm hearing just overall um, through this really rich conversation about Kardashians of all things, um, but also bravery is that like part of what it means to be brave and part of what it, if I'm hearing right is one to show up, but to show up authentically, right? Like right. That, that part of it is going to be your, you know, the spaces in which you can lead and all the spaces in which you are called to grow. And right. so, and I think that for the Kardashians, that's what we've seen over 20 seasons, you know, uh, early Caitlin to Caitlin now, uh, Kim early, you know, early Kim to Kim, you know, Kim just wanting to put herself in the very center to Kim uh, advocating for the imprisoned, right. uh, you, you know, like that there is growth in a trajectory of God's longing for all of us to be our best selves that can only be enacted when we show up in these spaces in our authentic selves because that's when we can do uh that's when bravery shows up uh, or the courage to be brave shows up um because we're all being authentic and vulnerable together well and and it's brave to know when to end right like they could have kept going forever but they've intentionally made this choice to stop the show because they're ready for something else or they don't want to be a slave to the show of always doing it this way. And I think, uh, you know, we've all been through transitions in our life that have been difficult or hard, or we wish, you know, we could just be here forever. But I think Brave is also listening to when it's time to end the show, you know, when it's time to end the, uh, the Kardashians know it's moving on. Well, else. good news. Uh, it is time to end the show, but we're going to do so with our final question. Uh, Spiff. Yeah. Uh, so Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming on. This is oh, yeah. fun to talk uh, to you guys. It's great. To, we hope you'll come back. Uh, it, you know, this has been really fun and, and it makes me think of Kardashians in new ways, uh, as this podcast has always done for, you know, pop culture for us. So, um, as our guests, we, uh, would love to know how you answer our final question, which is what biblical character theme book, you know, narrative, are you most reminded of in the Kardashians? I, I think about, I mean, the story that's coming to mind is the story of the prodigal son, which I have a lot of mixed views about that story, because I think that we overplay it in the church. Of course, how many sermons have you heard on that? You know, like 50, 500, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a narrative that we pose as like, there's the good kid, and then the kid that strays, and then the kid comes home, and you know, it, um, but you know, I, I had I heard a really great sermon recently on the, on the mother in the story and the, and the connection that she felt both to her son who was away and her husband and the tension in that relationship. Mm. And it made me think a little bit about Chris Kardashian and the tension that she must feel with all her children, all their different, you know, things that they do, they go, they come, they get married, they divorce, they have children, they don't, you know, and and that to be that person that somehow stays in the middle of relationships um, can be quite powerful. I like that. Yeah, you too. Arthur, you wanna go? Uh, I'm gonna say it's the letter to Philemon um, because if you read, and I say it weirdly, is it Philemon? I don't know, Philemon is how I know it. Philemon, um, <laughs> it's, if you read it as sarcastically as possible, it's kind of amazing. Oh, you know everything. And I'm so sorry you're inconvenienced, but Paul is guilting a guy because he has uh, enslaved a person. Um, and I like that it's, it's the transition of Kim Kardashian from I'm in the center bumping everybody to I'm going to leverage this celebrity to talk to a person who loves celebrity to at least get clemency affected for a few i'm going to use what i have to do the rest and i think it calls on us too for people who are in the spotlight like philemon was to do the right thing as well and a billionaire should be illegal but that's neither here nor there spiff um i went 
And I think all of, especially the girl, the, the girls embody this or the women embody this um, more distinctly, uh, but I'm going to go with Lydia mm -hmm. as uh, you know, we're in acts right now it's Pentecost. Uh, and uh, you know, you've got Lydia coming in as the fine purveyor of, of threads and things as our Kardashian women love to do. Um, and, and as a, you know, a biblical entrepreneur for lack of a better term, <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, that, uh, you know that Lydia shows up and and does kind of exactly what what latter the latter seasons and you know what the the women grew up into were these entrepreneurs of the things that they were allowed to be uh excess you know like Kylie's makeup maybe or she would or wouldn't have gone down a makeup route but you know being raised in front of the camera and makeup becomes part of like your identity and things like that and so to lean into those spaces to leverage them for you know the good work of the world which I do think that the, I think that they're 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 trying to be their best, and if you are trying to be your best, that is a brave thing to do. So, well, we have been keeping up with Elizabeth Hagen. Elizabeth, thank you so very much for being here. Oh, and I have Brave Church. If you want to see it, I just got Ooh. it like this week, so it's a real book. Mine hasn't come yet, but I keep watching all of your like. I watched Kevin Oban. And I was like, I want all the. I want my Brave Church. I wanted to have it. So, you know, this has yeah. Been. A neat, I like the color scheme on that. I, I know they said, I mean, I was, um, they said it appealed to men. So <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I'll be, I'll be damned. Okay. I know they, well, you know, most men are pastors anyway. Anyway, that's, but that's, that's a topic for another day, but yeah, Brave Church um, here too. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, thank you. And Brave Church is available soon. You can pre-order it now uh, through Upper right. Books or on yeah. Uh, bookshop.org which will there you go there you go booksellers <laughs> of your choice uh, i'm going to put up our promo screen because it is a reminder that maybe i'm going to if i remember how to uh we are of course sponsored by jeff one row designs that's a beautiful easter thing i'm gonna email you jeff and uh get a pentecost design to put up because pentecost and ordinary time are coming check them out jeff one row.com use the code two on one all one word, all letters for 15% off your Stoll's order. Spiff. Yes, sir. Next week? Uh, next week, we're gonna talk Bojack Horseman with Ashton Sorrels. Um, so uh, that should be fun. Uh, that, that'll be brave for all of us. <laughs> honor to uh, the Kardashians, to Bojack Horseman. We have a weird job, Spiff. We do. Yeah, but um, that's good. That's um, a good one. Elizabeth, thank you again. And, thank you. Uh, yes, thank deuces. you. We will see you next week. Please subscribe, share, like, all that jazz. This has been Two on One. Goodbye, everybody.